fly. Wow! Look how it just floats in the air. So carefree, so beautiful. Hey, let's follow it to see where it goes. Maybe it'll fly to the flower garden under the old elm tree. No way! We better go home or we'll be in big trouble. Besides, Grandma told us never to go anywhere near the elm tree. Remember, she said that there's ghosts there and that they turn us into butterflies if we stared at one long enough, especially during a full moon. You said there was no such thing as ghosts. Besides, I think it would be fun to be a butterfly. <laughs> hey, wait! No! Where am I? How can this be? There was no building here before. You know, fuck it, this ain't my problem. She'll find her own way out. I'm leaving. Well, shit. everyone, I'm High Trees and it seems I'm stuck in here now. Might as well do something useful, I guess. Uh, not sure what, but hey, it was mighty nice of my captors to leave me a fully working Sega CD. Hang on a minute, I got a PlayStation 2 last time. Fuck you, Daniela was a lot better than whoever you dickheads are. This thing sucks. And in fact, that was the topic of a conversation some time ago that I had with a friend. How much the Sega CD sucked and how poor its library was, really. And people argue back and forth, it was good, it was bad. Well, most of the library I find to be terrible, and so does my friends. So we're like, well, I wonder if there's any Sega CD games that don't totally suck. And there's some very specific conditions to this that we'll discuss at the end of the video. But, well, it seems we have this game here, this mansion of hidden souls. Never heard of it. I guess we should have a look. I mean, it's the only game I have here, so... Well, here we go. That isn't any good. What the hell is that? That's horrible. Let me fix that. Now, in all fairness, both versions of the music are just horrible. They're an ungodly racket. I don't know what the hell they were going for. The Model 2 is even worse. Now, that one barely uses PCM. I I'll never really understand who came up with that. But you would hope they either improved or didn't have a job now. I wonder if the same could be said for the people who made this game, or we really should take a look at it, because things are dragging on. Now, as you might have gathered, this game starts out with a couple of regular delinquents, you and your sister, seemingly in the middle of bloody nowhere, up to God only knows what. I mean, there's only two things I'd be doing with a girl in the forest in the middle of the night, and seeing as she's not dead, that really only leaves one possibility, and yeah, you probably do want to be in the middle of nowhere, miles away from anybody that knows who you are, if you're going to do things like that with your sister. Take it from me, I'm a total expert in these matters. Oh, well. But anyway, your sister runs off into a mansion that has just appeared, and you follow her, only to find yourself locked in. Now you have to find her. How typical. Well, that's basically it. It's a simple enough story to get you inside the door. You've got a reason and a motivation, and to be fair, the manual says it a lot better than I do. There exists a horrible, evil spirit in the elm tree in the flower garden. Do not go near it on any night when the moon is full. Anyone who looks at a butterfly that glows for a short time will turn into a butterfly themselves. It is an evening with a pale, full moon. 
The trees in the forest sway in the wind as they look up into a sky inlaid with the shapes of constellations, as in a shadow picture. Didn't you know that far back in these woods stands one large elm tree? It stands quietly in an earthly silence. There is a very strange legend about this tree that has been handed down since your grandmother was a child. No, even before that. There have been times when beautiful flowers bloomed around this elm tree. You know all about their vivid splendour. No one has ever heard the name of these flowers. These mysterious flowers have spread all over. Once every four years, under a magnificent full moon like this one, a cluster of butterflies appears out of nowhere and flies among the flowers which have blossomed. These butterflies, unsure of where to go, wander like dune bugs. Their wings become as clear as a lake and seem to take on the colour of the moonlit night. They shine with an indefinable beauty. No one has ever seen this. It is a sight one would only see in a the dream. Yeah, well, the translation maybe is a little bit rough here and there, but it sets the mood quite well, to be honest, and I think everything else is explained quite clearly. It's fairly obvious what it's trying to say and what things do in the game, but I wouldn't worry about memorising it. All of the vital game mechanics do get explained to you again in the game itself as you run into them, and in all honesty, they're pretty standard adventure game type things. If you've played a point-and-click adventure game, or even a pre-rendered one more like this, well, you're probably going to know what to do. It's the same kind of logic, so there's nothing really that complicated going on. And by adventure game logic, I mean the start of the game consists largely of you walking around looking at bloody everything with practically no idea what you're really supposed to be doing. You might also notice the choppy nature of things. That's not my crappy video editing or anything. The game just runs that way. It may be slightly faster on NTSC consoles. I'm in a PAL region despite running a US disc here, and this is a PAL console. It doesn't matter what you do, it's, it's always going to be a little bit choppy, it's, it's just the way things are. Now, in all fairness to it, the game's now in a full screen, as in you'll see something like this on a 4.3 television screen, so I guess it's kind of widescreen in that strange way that some old things were with the, the letterboxing. And there are quite a few areas you can go to and animations to see in this game, along with a decent amount of dialogue, which sounds fairly clear. Odds are they had to make some tough decisions regarding frame size versus performance and frame count versus quality or disk usage. Getting these things right is always something of an art form and whilst it maybe could have been done better in one respect, you'd have had to make a sacrifice somewhere else and I do see a, a certain level of ambition here that I can't help but appreciate. I think they at least tried. Let me put it this way, whenever you do anything, the access light on the Sega CD is constantly on, so I don't think they could stuff much more through that, to be honest. I think it's probably running things absolutely flat out in there. But what are we supposed to be doing in this place other than finding your sister? I mean, it's not going to be as simple as walking up to her. These games don't work that way. Well, it's adventure game type things which typically means finding an item and then figuring out what you're supposed to use it on. The game has an inventory, but it's incredibly simple. Basically, you, you make this appear and select the items with a single button, and then choose the item you want to use with just one more button. It, it's a very simple inventory system. There's no management or anything in it. Rarely will its use venture beyond the realm of pick up a key, use it on a door, or some other item which behaves like a key and will be used somewhere else in the same way. And let's be honest, that's how most of these games worked. There are one or two puzzles of sorts, but again, they're really quite simple. Certainly nothing on the level of what you'd find in games like Atlantis, where they could be downright obscure and infuriating to solve. No, by contrast, this game is often going to just give you the answer outright if you look for it and you don't usually have to look very far. 
in one of the rooms there's even a painting which will show you clues regarding where to go and what to do next. Which is actually kind of nice. I, I think it's a nice feature. I, I didn't find myself really needing to use this too much. You do have to use it once as far as I can tell. Now the simplicity of the inventory and the puzzles and such could be a good thing or a bad thing depending on how you look at it. Now personally comparing this game with Atlantis I think we're at two opposite ends of the scale and not in the middle ground that I prefer. With this game you're at least not so likely to get stuck for very long or throw your controller at the television screen. So yeah I, I guess it's okay. Now like the mentioned Atlantis game and several others in this time period the environments are all pre-rendered CGI, but you never leave the first-person perspective, which, considering this game's from 1994, you could argue was rather forward-facing in more ways than one. Though, obviously, they don't look as good as later games, or some of the ones which were starting to appear on the PC at around the same time. The control, or more so the range of motion, is also rather stiff. You can't just rotate the camera any way you'd like outside of the limited range available. The game will just turn you towards the next set point of rotation or move you towards the next nerd on the track. You can't skip these walking and turning animations either. Once you've pushed the button, it's going to go there. There's, there's not really anything you can do to just insta-warp yourself there. Although pushing the back button will turn you around 180 degrees, or as close to as is available on the track at that time. Now whilst it's not as pretty and elegant as some of the later pre-rendered games that were around, it's at least coherent and clean cut. It's been far less jumpy and awkward feeling than the many live action games that were on this Sega CD system. At least you know where you're headed when you press a button instead of having no idea where you're actually facing and which way is which. It goes without saying, you're going to meet other characters in this game, most of whom are butterflies, some of which are more friendly than others. They all have really interesting accents, and, well, let's be honest, the voice acting isn't that good. There's no way around it. Who are you? So you like the butterfly collections here? I collected them all when they were ugly human figures. In all fairness, I've said before, if the voice acting's going to be bad, I'd rather it was this kind of bad than the monotone and flat kind of bad. At least when it's somewhat exaggerated like this, you can tell what they're trying to say, like how they're trying to say it, and really it's quite clear, and the audio quality is, is quite clear as well. It's actually quite good by Sega CD standards. And you've got to remember, voice acting was a relatively new thing in games. There, there weren't that many games that actually spoke this much at this time, so... Yeah, I'm not sure we can really hit it that hard. Really, overall, there's no denying the game does quite a few things wrong. The visuals are as ugly as any of this old pre-rendered CGI, and the frame rate is low. The voice acting is questionable at best. Also, for most of the game, especially at the start, there's almost nothing that can actually kill you. The puzzles themselves aren't very hard, but sometimes it isn't obvious what to do because you can't pick up items until some other possibly unrelated interaction has been carried out, such as how you can enter this room at the start of the game and look at this table, but you can't pick up an item from this table until late in the game. Also, the game's really quite short, and it'll probably take you less than an hour to complete, even though it does throw you a math-based door puzzle right at the end. Hey, you know what? I think I've found the key to this place. What the hell? I can't pick it up. Oh, right, it's adventure game logic. I must have to do something else first, even though I'm pretty certain that's the right key. The controls can suffer delays. Heck, they seem to be downright unresponsive at times in this door maze. The music loops are really short, and the interaction is extremely limited outside of things you actually have to do. Although you can walk around and look at practically everything, so yeah, they've got that. They spent the time on rendering. Gotta give them that. We could nitpick all day, and it's been done. A lot of the reviews I've read of this game, well, they seem really focused on the things it does wrong. And it does do things wrong. There's no way of getting around that. But... I'd like to focus on some of the things it did right, because hindsight's kind of cool, really, and I think some of these things are kind of noteworthy. 
For one thing, this game uses CGI. It's pre-rendered CGI, it's not running in real time. You were effectively watching a clip of it. That was They used to do that in some games back then. But, well, if we put it up against a game like Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit's using live-action video. And there's a problem with this. If you take a cast and a camera crew around a burning building set ten times over, the clips are never going to quite mesh seamlessly when it crosses paths with somewhere you've already been or somewhere that was filmed at a different time in the schedule. And it's probably going to require a clip be stuffed awkwardly between them to try and cover this up when really it just draws more attention to it, which is something Fahrenheit does, and it does look crap. So, yeah, using CGI means mention of Hidden Souls is completely devoid of this, because, let's face it, the computer's going to follow the exact same path to the exact pixel, and so every different route is going to mesh pretty seamlessly, you're not going to notice. So that's cool. Back on Fahrenheit, well, people say this game's short, but when you compare the two, and granted Fahrenheit is renowned for being terrible as well, but you, when you compare the two, this game Mention of Hidden Souls isn't really short by Sega CD standards, and comparing it to a game like Fahrenheit is probably only about 10 minutes shorter if you make all the right moves. And it's not so much the length that I'm going after, because as we just asserted, it's, it's pretty much normal length for one of these full motion Sega CD games. And you think, ah, but the frame rate's bad and this and that. Well, the thing is, given the length of the game, Fahrenheit, yeah, about 10 minutes longer, but it recycles clips, especially in the last stage. There's only three stages in that game, and on the last stage, it just recycles the same clip in what are meant to be different areas. Mansion of Hidden Souls doesn't do this. Every area looks different. It uses its own animation sequences, or pre-rendered sequences. So, yeah, now you might be thinking, well, what we were saying about having to drop frames just to save on disk space, it's looking quite viable as a... they might have actually had to do that, which is kind of cool, because Sega CD games often recycle stuff like it's going out of fashion, and this game doesn't, unless you count being able to actually choose where you're going and walk back the way you've come. I mean, I, I guess then it's technically recycling it. A lot of the games you're basically on rails, and that's a problem to me as well. Being on rails, it sucks. This game's on rails as it were, but you choose which way you want to travel on the rail, which is a lot better to me. It still feels like you've got a little bit more freedom. And to be honest, the limited controls actually sort of help with the horror element. It makes you feel a little bit more vulnerable because you're on this really stiff path. You don't have much choice over where you're going or what speed you move at. It does make you feel just a tiny bit vulnerable. It's not real scary or anything, but it I don't know, it's, it's hard to explain. It's, I think one of the Resident Evil games, uh, so I heard a rumour that they actually made the controls worse on purpose for this reason, and whilst I don't think that's a deliberate choice here, it, it does actually sort of play in the game's favour a little bit at times. I would wager that there are way more unique frames in Mansion of Hidden Souls in the order of thousands, possibly tens or hundreds of thousands, versus the same few recycled clips that go over and over in Fahrenheit. The audio in Mansion of Hidden Souls does not cut out when you move, What happened to this butterfly? A lot of Sega CD games which use the whole moving on a rail, full motion thing have their audio cut off completely at the start of each sequence. Again, take Fahrenheit, because that's what I have to hand, the music and sound effects stop and are rendered as part of the clip itself. You want me to get rid of this now? Make up your mind. It's out of here. Mention of Hidden Souls doesn't do this, and whilst the music loops are very short, they almost never get interrupted by the mere act of turning around or a sequence starting. Usually the only way the music is interrupted is to change to some different music.
They aren't even interrupted by the beginning of a dialogue sequence, and whilst the voice acting is a bit wooden, it was mixed well, and it sounds clear. The dark is safer if you have a light. Take this and run quickly. It's, it's pretty good by Sega CD standards as far as effects and voices go. But really, the fact the game even has voices at all was still a new thing at the time, and you'd be hard-pressed to find a game with much better acting than this. Pretty much all games were poor on this front at the time. The actors in this game exaggerate their voices quite a lot, which, in my opinion at least, is better than sounding flat. You can at least understand how they're trying to say the things that they're saying, even if it really does sound false. Now, on top of these positives, there's also the fact that you can save the game at any time once you've collected the diary. This item can be used at any time to save of one of the three possible slots. And you can use different slots as the game goes on, so you can have three ongoing save points. In fact, this is the only Sega CD game I've ever played and that I even know of which has full-on manual saving like this. It's, it's rare to see this on a console game in general. It's a very unusual feature. And this subject leads us on to some odd foreshadowing that this game seems to have done completely unintentionally. For one thing, the diary being used to save the game would become a thing in later horror games. Harry Mason uses them in Silent Hill, and Alyssa Hamilton uses them in Clock Tower 3. Likely it's a coincidence, although... Music sounds oddly familiar. In fact, it sounds a lot like a song from Silent Hill 2. does actually sound quite similar, doesn't it? Uh, I'm sure it's just a coincidence, but yeah, the Silent Hill 2 track is actually called Butterfly Nest, apparently. Flares in a room that's full of butterflies. Just before you reach into the darkness to grab a key item, which actually happens in both games just after this similar music plays, although it happens in a different way. I, I'm sure it's just a coincidence. When you know both games, your mind probably starts reading things into it that isn't there, but a, a part of me does wonder with Silent Hill 2, just because of the, the mere fact that, that it's not the only similar sounding thing in there. You know, I almost wonder if maybe the devs played this years ago, like before they developed the game, and it was just there in the back of their minds, they didn't consciously notice. The whole butterfly thing, though, I mean, Ruler Rose has butterflies. It felt Frame has butterflies in, in the second game. Clock Tower 3 has Celestial Moths, which like, aren't butterflies, but close enough. So uh, maybe that's just a Japanese thing that I'm not aware of. I don't know much about Japanese culture. I don't want to make myself look like an idiot by guessing, or more of an idiot than I already do. But, yeah, maybe they're like a really bad omen in in their culture or something. Feel free to enlighten me, because they do seem to be a recurring pattern in these games. I have to wonder why, because I don't think this thing could have been that influential. It's, there's got to be something else there. I still do wonder about the Silent Hill 2 one just a little bit, though. I can't lie. The passage of time in this game is non-linear. Time will not move forwards if you stand still, and in some later horror games, Time doesn't pass if you stand in puzzle rooms or doorways, which seems oddly familiar to the way things work here, only it's way more extreme in the case of this game because it's, it's any movement at all. The first person perspective was still quite new at the time too, and horror games in the 1990s seemed to really favour third person with fixed position cameras. It wasn't until the latter half of the first decade in this century that we started getting first person in 
in horror and adventure type games been the norm which isn't necessarily something I agree with but it's the way things went and before we forget there's also the fact that there's no heads up display which is you know, survival horror it's not really I guess because things are not really trying to kill you but yeah that in like horror themed games you know it became a thing later not to have that for better immersion there's also the seamless entry into the game, the seamless transition between the opening cutscene and the game itself. Yeah, you get the start game menu, but that's just like a pause in it until you decide what you're doing, and then it just carries on like from where it left off with no change in how things look or anything. Which, again, isn't so really so back then. That seems like a more recent thing, and even then I think it's quite rare. Which is a shame, because I quite like it, been done that way, it's uh, kind of neat. Also, the use of voice acting is kind of novel in the case of this game, just because not that many games really had voices in them yet. All in all, I genuinely do feel there was an ambition behind this game, even if the end product wasn't the best thing since sliced bread. Also, having to develop for a pretty weak and heavily limited system, that there really wasn't much else they could have likely done. At least not without making development of the game completely unrealistic. Remember, as you start taking longer to improve these things, it's going to cost more to make. And yeah, this is still kind of testing the waters. You don't want to invest too much time and money into this. It, it might flop completely, which I guess the platform kind of did. and didn't really do all that well, the Sega CD. And I don't think this game sold all that well either, so... Hmm, yeah... All in all, then, the gameplay isn't very gripping. It plays more like an interactive story with just a little hint of adventure and a very mild hint of horror elements. The replay value is extremely low. It's a long way from perfect, but let's try to score it. So first of all, graphics, 14 out of 20. Yeah, it's not a perfect score, and these were never going to really be all that high, but... It's not low either, they do get extra points for not having the awkward and obvious joints like the live action games have, as well as using unique sequences for each area. No two areas look alike or use any of the same frames. There's practically nothing in the way of recycled visuals in this game. And those visuals aren't offensive to the eyes as such but they're obviously a little bit ugly, if only because they're on the fairly limited Sega CD. And that's the thing, this game would only be possible with the Sega CD. You wouldn't be able to do this kind of thing practically on the stock Mega Drive Genesis system. I bet it was painful compromising on frame size, quality and count to fit this on the disc. I mean, consider the seventh guest, which was still relatively new, required two discs on the PC. Also, the PC had a much higher colour palette than the Sega console does here, so this thing was always going to look really blocky, or they could have probably ramped the dithering up, but it would have taken longer to render, and it would possibly look worse at such a low resolution. They, they really wear up against it here, I don't think they could win either way. So, I'm not going to dock it too hard. It's not that bad, and by Sega CD standards, it's actually pretty good. Sound 15 out of 20. It gets extra points just for using music in 3-4 time, because I like waltz. Uh, and also for not having the music be interrupted by every little thing that happens, and having no vocals in the music, that also helps, because there's a hell of a lot of that on the Sega CD. And honestly, without the vocals and from the use of waltz, the theme to this game doesn't really sound all that dated. That sort of music doesn't age that badly. The, the only thing that gives it away is it, it has this distinctly 90s sampler, synth, rompler kind of sound going on in a lot of places. But yeah, the, the sound is there consistently throughout the game. It, it doesn't chop and interrupt like it does in a lot of other games. And when it does, there's generally a good reason for it. Usually the music's changing, or something's happening that should interrupt it for some kind of dramatic effect. 
The loops are short though, and they can get a bit repetitive if you're stuck in one area for quite a while. Odds are you're not going to be in the same area for more than a couple of minutes at best though. I mean, you're moving around most of the time through this game, and you're going to be going in different areas with different music, or different ambient tracks. The sound effects are also quite limited, but their quality is is really quite good for the Sega CD. They don't sound all that gritty or anything, and it's usually pretty clear what they mean. Also, the voices, whilst they are wooden, do sound very clear. They're very easy to make out. There's there's not really any mush or grain or or anything wrong with the recording and mixing of them. The, the mixing's actually really well done. They, the background track does not drown the voices at all, which was a problem even in games much later on. Think Sonic Adventure, where you can barely hear what anyone's saying because the music's so loud. Yeah, they actually didn't do too bad on this, especially given they probably were on limited disc space by the time they got around to doing the sound side of things. Atmosphere, 17 out of 20. Now, you know what? This actually works. And No, I'm not joking with you. I genuinely get this weird, dreamy vibe from this game. <laughs> And I did even before I'd read what it said in the manual, which says this is all like something you would see in Other Dream, or something like that. Which to me implies that they achieved what they were trying to. Like, they obviously did something right, because it, it does give that vibe to me. The grainy visuals and those little music and ambient loops actually help it a little bit too. It, it just sort of makes everything seem a little bit more weird. One point is deducted for the clock sound, though. I fucking hurt clocks. I genuinely hate clocks that tick. I hate them. I want to break them. They must die. Self-important bastards. Are you fucking mocking me? Die, clocks! Die! But yeah, the atmosphere is actually quite strong in this game, and I think it deserves to score reasonably high here. It... it as I said, it seems to have done what it set out to do, and that impresses me, considering how limited the platform is. Story and design, 14 out of 20. Yeah, the story's quite simple, but it is kind of weird, and that wins back some points. Although it loses a few again, because I don't think it was implemented as well as maybe it could have been. For one thing, the lack of ways to actually fail at the game and die is a little bit disappointing. On the other hand, I haven't found any situation where you can end up in unwinnable state, something you could still do in a lot of games when this was around, aside from possibly saving a little too late once you reach the end parts of the game, which impose a time limit. If you've lost too much time and you save the game and load it from there, yeah, I, I mean, you you might end up in an unwinnable state. That's the only place I could think where it would happen. Look, I, I could ramble on all day, so to keep things short, whilst you could argue that there are a lot of things missing from this game, what is there does seem to work quite well and does seem to work the way it's supposed to. The game is kind of short, but for its time, it's not too bad. Certainly not when compared to other Sega CD games anyway. It seems about right by those standards, which... Yeah, considering the complete lack of recycled sequence in this one is definitely quite passable, if nothing else. I'd say it was better than passable. I'd, I'd say they'd done a decent job with that. But that's more in the graphics department, and so it's not going to really push the score back up in this category. Still, they did all right. The game doesn't break or anything, and you know, the story's interesting enough. I mean, you are basically playing the story. That's the whole premise of this game, really. So, controls and gameplay, 13 out of 20. Due to the fact you're basically on a forced path with little room for deviation, the gameplay is quite limited, being more of an interactive story than an actual game, as was the nature with these pre-rendered move-on-a-rail type games. The elements that are there are quite small and simple, largely those of adventure games and just a little hint of horror games that were starting to evolve from them. I mean, you've got to remember, this was a world that didn't have things like Resident Evil in it yet. We didn't even have the first Clock Tower game yet. You know, they, 
this was kind of just an emerging genre. There was a long way to go. You wouldn't really call this game a survival horror because, well, there's not that much that can kill you and it's extremely linear, all things considered. But, hey, this simplicity and the you're basically just playing the story might not really be a terrible thing because another genre that would emerge and become more well-known later on would be interactive drama. And games like Heavy Rain would sell quite well in later years, but they are definitely more complex than this one. This game could still be considered a, a precursor to those in some ways. It, it is an interactive story of sorts. It has some very similar premises, and I've not really seen anyone else touch upon that. So, yeah, we're, we're sort of uh, just in the grey area of, of three genres here, really. It's it's uh, it's early enough that it's not quite sure where to go with itself, I guess. There are no big scares or anything like that to be had in this game, but then I do think they were trying to be child-friendly with it, so yeah, it probably isn't far to start comparing it with titles targeting adult audiences that came later. I mean, sure, Demento has a bunch of creepy stalkers and use of guns and things like that, but it also comes with a 17 rating on the case, whereas Mansion of Hidden Souls has a rather innocent GA rating on it. There's just not really any comparison in that regard, so we have to judge it as a GA rated game. As I said before, the team who made this seem to have at least tried, and they don't look to be a particularly huge team, and they do genuinely seem to have had some real ambition behind this idea. Plus, it is a real Sega CD game, but I'll get onto that more in a second. The controls in the game are simple enough that they don't really offer anything noteworthy to mark the score up or mark the score down. The game does support the Mega Mouse, but this is just awkward because it still works like a D-pad. Obviously there's no precise turning or anything, so it's a little bit clunky. I'd, I'd recommend just using the control pad. There's really no advantage to using the mouse here, it, it just doesn't feel natural. So the total score for this game is 73 out of 100. I wouldn't recommend paying big money for this, and you should be ready to discover that there's almost nothing in the way of replay value when you're finished with it. Unless you're really into this old pre-rendered CGI look or something, or must earn every game on the Sega CD. But there's one important thing. It doesn't suck. Yeah, this was my goal here, to find a real Sega CD game that didn't completely suck balls. There were some rules for this, mostly that by real Sega CD game, I mean a game that actually uses the Sega CD hardware extensively, which naturally rules out the many Sideways Space Invaders clones from Japan that could have been done on the regular Mega Drive, but had badly rendered recordings of MIDI music as Redbook CD audio. Those games where they should have just made a regular Mega Drive cartridge and included an OST CD. But even then, it would have been a terrible OST CD that nobody would have listened to. It also ruled out games like Sonic CD. Yeah, yeah, I, I know, it's it's smoother and the music and shit than it would have been on a cartridge. I've heard it before, but you can't seriously tell me that Rystar isn't better in every single way than Sonic CD is. It looks better, it plays better, it has better music. I guess that's subjective, but yeah, I'm sorry, I think Rystar's a better game, and it didn't need the CD, so Sonic CD isn't a real Sega CD game in my opinion, it just has CD music. And even then, the music's not that good. It's actually really annoying, and it has vocals in it, and it sounds dated. the 90s but this shit just didn't age well and somebody's probably going to suggest Night Trap but it wasn't originally developed for the Sega CD so well whilst it's passable and I guess it could count it does seem wrong to count that 
I, it didn't really tick the boxes for me quite right, but yeah, I guess maybe. Arcade ports, maybe, because I mean that was still a large part of the home console library. If they were using the Sega CD hardware, yeah, not really into arcade games all that much though. I'm, I'm the generation that killed the arcade, you remember? But whatever, there we are. That's Mansion of Hidden Souls for the Sega CD. It's a decent enough interactive story, if nothing else. It's a fun little distraction to play at least once. If you stumble into it for cheap, then why not grab it if you're into such things? But don't expect to be particularly scarred. There's really nothing all that scary about this game at all. It's very children's Halloween kind of thing, I guess, uh, compared to what we're used to today. And of course, don't expect to find yourself with much of an urge to replay it or to work out particularly gripping gameplay and puzzles because it really doesn't have that kind of thing going for it. This isn't a game to write home about and it won't find itself at the top of your favourite games list, but it's adequate and by Sega CD standards I'd say adequate was pretty damn good. That's really the best you could ask for on this platform because overall... The Sega CD is pretty awful and it has a lot of bad games on it. You know, I hate to sound like somebody else who likes to review video games, but it's it's kind of like finding a, a one cent coin in the bottom of the toilet or something. I mean, yeah, it's only one cent. It's not really great, but it's still a lot better than anything else you've found in there. And let's be honest, if you're going to go stuffing your hand into dirty public lavatories, you better expect it to get covered in shit. I mean, that one coin is really... Probably the best you could ask for, and even then, I think you're probably taking liberties hoping for that in the first place, to be honest. It's, yeah, it, it is clunky. But you've got to remember, at this time in the 90s, people wanted realism. They wanted 3D, or something that looked 3D. And it hadn't really been done that much. The whole 3D first-person perspective, or a simulation of it, the whole voice acting and everything... These developers had nothing much to go on. They, they didn't have. They they had to make all the mistakes that hadn't been made and learned from yet. They they stuck developing for a really weak, underpowered system with a lot of serious limitations. I really do think that they had some ambition behind this, and they maybe even had to scale back their ideas. As happens, there's just. I don't really see what else they could have done trying to develop something like this on system that wouldn't have made it worse. And as I say, by Sega CD standards, you know, compare it to the library out there. This is an actual Sega CD game. It uses the Sega CD hardware. It's not just a Mega Drive game or Genesis game playing CD audio over the top. Really, I'm actually quite impressed, all things considered. It's it's not bad. It's not bad at all. It's it's not really good, but it's not really bad. And like I say, going comparatively with the Sega CD, that's pretty damn good. I really don't think you could expect much more from it. If you find it cheap, or if you just happen to find a, an ISO and run it in an emulator or something, I guess, then why not have a go? But right, I'm done here anyway. Fuck this. I'm getting out of here. I can pick it up. This is what I had to do. Great. I don't know where my sister's gone. She's not in here. Fuck this. She probably just went behind the building to take a shit or something. Let's go and sneak up on her and kick her in the back while she's popping a squat. How the hell does that work? Wait a minute. Want to buy a TV? No, I don't want to buy a TV. Well, fine, there's no Hang need on, to be That's my TV. What are you doing? You can get Channel 5 anywhere, that? but if you don't want it, then I'll just take it off your hands. I'll just keep it. Suits me fine. God, you try and do oh, people a good deed and they just don't I want guess. to know. I'm high treason, thanks for watching. And as always, remember don't be a screw up. Load DOS 622.
Yeah, now while goofing around the side, there are a couple of things I forgot to mention that are worth bearing in mind. Firstly, is how small the team seems to be that worked on this. Like, if you go by the credits at the end, there's like five or six people listed. I don't know how many worked on the graphics, I don't know if SSD is short for someone's name or if that's another team, but you know, that's less than ten people in all likelihood who made this. With the voice actors in, that's still not even 15 names attached to this thing. It's, uh, it's a really small team, and, you know, what do you, don't go in with really high expectations. I mean, it's a game from a telecommunications company in Japan, you know. Uh, what can you expect? But uh, I do honestly think they did well, especially, like I say, considering it's not a particularly big team, and it's from 1993 this was in development, you know, it's... I mean, what what else could they have done? They didn't. They wouldn't have known where to go with this yet. It was still a, a new thing, you know. It was emerging genres that weren't even established or recognised as really been a thing yet that they were trying to get into. It's uh, you know, I don't, I don't really know. Like as I say, Resident Evil and stuff was a long way away at this time, so. I don't know what else they could have really done, but don't go in with really high expectations by the standards of things that came later. Uh, if you're in Europe or the UK, good luck finding it. I can't even find evidence to say it came out over here. I mean, I can find mentions, oh, it came out in this year, but <laughs> that's it. That's all I can find, so I don't know if it did. I've never seen a, a copy of it for this region. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't know that you'll be able to track it down that way. There are other ways of playing it, you know, you can get it to run on a PAL console. In my case, I load a, a US BIOS from a flash cartridge for the Sega CD. That does work. Uh, and you can always use emulation. Or you can, if you've got a, a US system, you can obviously just play it on that. And uh, just swap the BIOS out the hard way even. The Japanese version is in Japanese, as far as I know, so, yeah, uh, your memory mystery mention, or something it's called, uh, uh, I don't know, man, but, yeah, that's, that's some things to bear in mind. Anyways, I, I am definitely out of here now, so thanks for watching.